free to interact with our teachers, professor. Uh, yes, professor uh, Nalli Yuvra sir is there. Professor Arsel Vara sir is there. M M Rai sir is there. You know M M Rai sir. And just uh, don't hesitate in asking questions also, and don't hesitate yes. in answering also. So we we have learned by making mistakes only. Yeah, we have we, yes. we have sent wrong answer in our postgraduate days, and then we learned no, this is the right answer. So that is the right way. M M Rai sir, exactly. Any words. And uh, uh, Ananda Pal, he will also join. Yes, sir, he will so, join. Yes, he will join in five minutes. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. She will come, and uh, I hope the um, professor uh, Nelly will be the first speaker. No, the first okay. session, yes, probably. Uh, so uh, I hope he will enjoy his yes, uh, lecture. I will start it straight away. Can we, sir? Yes, sir. No, so uh, just we will uh, now we are going live, sir. We will have a welcome note by our president, okay, West Bengal okay. Orthopedic yeah. Association, Professor okay. Chinmay Day, sir. Professor okay. Chinmay Day, sir. Chinmay Day, sir. I think Chinmay, yeah. Acho. Chinmay. Ah, yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. We say, yes. yes, sir. Yes. We will start, sir. Please have a sir, welcome yes. note. Sir. Yes. So, welcome, Professor Selvaraj and Professor Nali to be here with us to help us. And to help our students on uh, PG uh, classes. Actually, this uh, course we are running for a long time, really activated by Dr. Rajiv Raman. And uh, we are lucky that you will be with us to help the students and to add new knowledge. And also, there will be a interaction session which will be helpful much for the postgraduate students. So, with these few words, I conclude my starting uh, speech. Thank you all again. Thank you, sir. Over to M.M. Rai, sir, the series coordinator. M.M. Rai, sir, please, sir. Mm. Uh, good evening. First of all, I will uh, I welcome all the teachers as well as the our PG, PGTs and those who are in the remote side who are giving the our program. And uh, now let me introduce our teacher, Professor Nalli Ramanathan Jivaraj. We commonly call him Nelly Sir. Nelly Sir is very famous and well-known personality and teacher in the country and very dynamic teacher, I should say. Now he is working as Professor of Spine Surgery in Ortho Spine Surgery Unit in Institute of Orthopedics and Traumatology. I had been there few, several times as examiner. Madras Medical College, Chennai. Next, he has uh, several uh, publications, 48 national and international journals, presentations, more than 28 in national and uh, state level. And he was awarded many. He, was, he got the award, Professor M. Natarajan Gold Medal, in 1992, he got the award, National Award of Excellence at the 48th Annual Conference of Indian Orthopedic Association, Chennai. And he was also awarded the Best Doctor Award at Bone and Joint Celebration 2012 by the Tamil Nadu uh, Dr. MGR University. And he was, he was also awarded Best Teacher Award by the Madras Orthopedic Societies on 6 September 2020. Next slide, please. He was, uh, he hold many positions in different associations like Secretary, Madras Orthopedic Society, Joint Secretary, Tamil Nadu Orthopedic Association, Executive Committee Member, Orthopedic Association, South Indian States. Secretary Tamil Nadu Orthopedic Association, Vice President Madras Orthopedic Society, President elect Madras Orthopedic Society, President Madras Orthopedic Society, then uh, Vice President Tamil Nadu Orthopedic Association, President elect Tamil Nadu Orthopedic Association, President Tamil Nadu Orthopedic Association 2014 15, and Secretary General Orthopedic Association of South Indian States. Next slide, please. And that is all a uh, part of his, uh, in it, about him in Dr. Nalli, but uh, many, many more things uh, is there. But uh, Dr. we are not going to waste much time with his uh, introduction because he's already introduced. Now I will uh, 
introduce our next guest speaker and teacher, Dr. R. Selvaraj. Dr. Selvaraj is here, no? Dr. Silvaraj, is there any problem in connection? No. Can you hear me? I do not uh, hear your voice, please, till now. I can hear you, sir. I can okay, hear you. Okay, thank you. Yes, good evening, good evening. Good evening, everybody. Okay, okay good evening. Good evening, good evening Paul, sir. Dr. Dr. Silvaraj, a young orthopedic teacher. He came several times in Calcutta for many purposes. I know I know him very well for, uh, since 2007 in Iocon 2007 in Calcutta. I know he, he at that time probably you had a uh, secretary, no secretary or Madras Orthopedic Association, is it? Uh, I think Tamil Nadu Orthopedic Association at that time. I know. Yes, yeah, yeah. Now uh, he is schooling and return now. Hmm. So you presently you he is uh, work, uh, presently what you are in uh, St Kar Karpanga Vidya Institute of Medical Science. Yes. Okay, I saw uh -huh. right. He served in various capacities in the teaching side from 1997 to 2018 and retired from government service as dean of government of. Kumari Medical College, presently working as professor and HOD ortho, Karpaga uh, Binaya Institute of Medical Science. He was executive committee member of TNA from 1999 to 2001, did fellowship secretary of TNO from 2001 to 2003, and she was secretary of TNOA from 2006 to 8 and president of TNA from 2013 to 14. Next slide, please. Uh, he was executive member of the IOE in 2001 to 3 and co chairman of IT committee of IOE from 2003 to 5. Presently, he is the vice president of YSA Orthopedic Association of South Indian States from Tamil Nadu. And special interest is trauma surgery, limb reconstruction, and hip replacement. He's really, he's uh, I know he's an active sportsmanship and with an in interest in cricket. And last time also in Calcutta, you played cricket agent. I think so. Uh, next slide. That's it, sir. This much we have? Last, last slide, sir. This is last slide. Oh, okay. And that's all about uh, Dr. Silvaraj. Uh, we are very happy and we welcome Dr. Nalli and Dr. Selvaraj in this program, sir. And Professor please... Ekepal sir has joined, sir. Professor Ekepal okay. sir. Okay. Oh, yeah. I, I welcome Professor Anandapal. Good evening, good evening, sir. HOD young... of IPJMR, one of the most IPJMR, specific. IPJMR, and he's a young orthopedic uh, professor in Bengal and very dynamic and very close to Professor D.P. Boxi uh, with many uh, innovative works, I hope. You will enjoy his lectures as well. Dr. Silvaraj has also came in my institution as a DNB examiner. <laughs> right, right. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir, we can start, sir. No. Yeah. So am I starting with my lecture? Yes, sir. Yeah. yeah. I'll uh, share my screen now. Yeah. Hope you are able to see my screen. Yes, sir. Yeah. You are audible also. Make it a presentation. And... Yes, sir. I think uh, at the outset, I would like to thank the, uh, uh, the West Bengal Orthopedic Association for giving me this opportunity to uh, uh, speak to the younger orthopedic surgeons, the future orthopedic surgeons of, uh, uh, I wouldn't say West Bengal alone. I think a lot of people from outside the state also must be doing their uh, courses there. And uh, I start my lecture with uh, uh, respects to all the senior professors and uh, um, our uh, respected colleagues who are also part of this program. Uh, in fact, when uh, Professor M.M. Ray uh, uh, invited me to deliver a lecture, I was not very sure like uh, what the target audience was. And uh, now I come to know that it's going to be postgraduate. So I had to tailor my talk according to that because this is a talk which I prepared for the Tamil Nadu Orthopedic Association uh, uh, postgraduate lecture, which lasted for nearly two hours, I should say. But of course, we had a lot of discussions. 
and uh, i will have to rush through like uh, uh, the various uh, i have a lot of videos also here now so i i think i would like to rush through them so that we will uh, stick on yeah. so like uh, i shall be talking to you about the uh, spine clinical examination the tips and the tricks which will be very useful for the examination going post graduates so as in the any other system the uh, clinical examination consists of uh, a detailed history then uh, uh, passing through inspection palpation movements measurements and neurological examinations now uh, more mistakes are made from want of proper examination than for any other reason and the ability to gather the appropriate information from the history and the physical examination forms the foundation of a well constructed and effective therapeutic regimen now though there are a lot of technical advances in the form of uh, modern imaging which has really helped us in uh, uh, understand uh, have better understanding of the various uh, uh, ailments of the various diseases in fact a complete and accurate history a, a skill that has to be mastered by each and every one of us leads to a differential diagnosis and based upon the differential diagnosis we do the appropriate physical examination and the radiographic evaluation now as far as spine disorders are concerned um, commonly the patient comes uh, uh, with the complaints of pain deformity and neurological deficit the patient is not going to tell you like uh, as far as neurological deficit is concerned they are not going to come and tell you that i have a neurological deficit they might come with complaints of numbness in the limbs or difficulty in walking or a feeling of unsteadiness now we shall be going in detail about each one of the complaints coming to the pain uh, the site of the we got to ask for the uh, site of the pain whether it is radiating the quality of the pain the chronicity of the pain the severity of the pain aggravating and alleviating factors now coming to the site of the pain uh, most often the uh, uh, any the pain arising from the uh, ax, uh, from the spine is uh, uh, located in the axial region Uh, as you can see here now if it, depend, depending upon the region of the spine involved it can be present either in the neck the cervical spine region or it can be in the uh, thoracic spine and also remember that any uh, problem uh, pain from the cervical spine can radiate to the interscapular region also and then pain can be in the uh, lumbar region and up to this sacral region you can have the pain but of course you got to remember the uh, referred pain uh, like due to the uh, various ailments in the viscera Now, what you call as a viscerogenic pain can also present with pain presenting in the lower back. Like for example, the most common one is a cardiac uh, pain that due to ischemia can be presenting in the shoulder region or also in the interscapular region there. And similarly, the various other uh, like for example, the cholelithiasis can present pain in the uh, dorsal lumbar region. So like that, you got to remember that the viscerogenic pain can present with the axial related pain, and uh, this has to be kept in mind. but the dermatomal pattern of the distribution of the pain should be uh, looked for uh, if it's going to be a spinal ailment so that is going to help us in uh, telling us whether it is a referred pain or it is a or it is a pain arising from the uh, spine now coming to the quality of the pain whether it is a referred pain or radicular pain uh, like uh, as far as spine is concerned referred pain uh, in spine can be from the disc or the facet joint and of course the radicular pain is due to the root involvement you must be knowing that so if you compare uh, both of these referred pain is less discrete and they are poorly localized and worsens over the course of the day whereas radicular pain is a deep aching or shooting pain and it's got a specific distribution what you call as a dermatomal pattern of distribution and it also worsens by maneuvers that increase intrathecal pressure like for example coughing or a uh, sneezing or the various maneuvers we have where, whereby we can use uh, increase intrathecal pressure that aggravates the radicular pain and and the referred pain is not accompanied by any neurological signs and symptoms whereas the radicular pain is accompanied by neurological signs and symptoms now severity of the pain you got to enquire whether the uh, pain is present only with physical demanding activities or the uh, pain is there uh, affecting the activities of daily living so that is that indicates the uh, severity of the pain now coming to aggravating and alleviating factors pain due to mechanical dysfunction of spine is aggravated by general or specific activities and relieved by rest and this is helpful in differentiating pain due to other extra spinal causes what i what is meant the viscerogenic causes like uh, pain arising from duodenal ulcer or from pancreatic disease or arising from the bladder or the kidneys like that similarly uh, herniated lumbar discs the pain is aggravated by sitting and bending forward and by increased intrathecal pressure it aggravates the pain and the lumbar facet syndrome or spondylolysis here the pain is aggravated by standing or extension of the spine So very very typically, it is by extension of the spine it aggravates the pain. Now, pain due to inflammatory disorders are commonly pres uh, present more in the early morning, and they can present as early morning stiffness also. 
and is associated with polyarthralgia or enthesopathies and is reduce and it reduces the activity reduces with the activity like as the day passes the pain comes down and it is worsens during the cold climate so this is in, indicative of inflammatory disorder metabolic infectious and malignant dis disorders may initially present as accelerated pain so these are characterized by being constant unremitting pain not impacted by physical activity and also pain bothersome at night and at rest so then such cases you should think in terms of a tumor or an infection now there are uh, certain red flags uh, uh, in the history which uh, should alert you on um, uh, like you got to go in for a uh, whether these patients should be referred or whether we should go in for a detailed evaluation so see like for example we, we cannot be doing a detailed examination for each and every case that comes to us whereas the, the, with the presence of red flag signs we should uh, be cautioned about uh, doing a detailed examination as well as evaluation also of course detailed examination has to be done for each and every case but the the, uh, the evaluation like the radiological and the various investigations it has to be started immediately in cases uh, of patients presenting with red flag signs so these are the various uh, uh, red flag signs there uh, like for example the, the indicators for immediate referral are loss of sphincter tone urinary fecal incontinence atelectasis or gait disturbances whereas uh, uh, other uh, like uh, other red flag signs are the, the following ones which you got to keep in mind i'll not go into detail because for want of time now um, the spinal stenosis uh, um, presents with the pain uh, which is affected by increased lumbar lordosis like for example like when the patient standing or walking uh, and this uh, like for example this leads on to the posterior disc compression and bulging into the canal or there may be facet overriding or buckling of the ligament of flaim all these leads to encroachment further upon the central canal and the neural foramen which is already narrowed by the hypertrophic facets and the degenerative disc so uh, you should remember that normally the disc dimensions of the lumbar canal and the neural foramen are increased when the spine is flexed as you can see here when the spine is flexed here see the dimension here whereas if it's going to be extended it is narrow so with the uh, in a degenerative spinal stenosis uh, because of these factors the there's a further encroachment upon the a uh, central canal and the neural foramen on extension and this leads on to presentation of symptoms that is the reason why the patient gets relief of symptoms by attaining particular pose especially when there's a flexion attitude of the spine is there they these people uh, get a, uh, relief of symptoms now the pain in the lower extremities uh, which are accentuated by ambulation the patient comes to us with a complaint that uh, i develop pain or uh, symptoms when i am able to walk i'm not able to walk for uh, even for a shorter distance or even in fact the patient may not be even be able to stand for short or shorter short periods so this is what is known as, known as a claudicatory pain now you should remember that there are two types of claudicatory pain one is a neurogenic claudication uh, claudication and a vascular claudication so the i i would, you should know all the post graduates should definitely know the difference between the neurogenic claudication and the vascular claudication so the uh, neurogenic claudication is uh, uh, relieved by sitting or bending or leaning like any uh, posture where there's flexion of the spine Uh, this leads on the relief of the symptoms whereas vascular claudication just by standing or walking itself uh, the patient has relief of symptoms whereas uh, in neurogenic claudication walking uphill when you bend your spine flex your spine uh, or when you're riding a bicycle it becomes painless whereas when you're walking down hill where you have extension of the spine it becomes more painful whereas in vascular claudication walking up hill is painful whereas down hill is easier to walk they are painless and the bicycle riding is also painful also here now the uh, most important thing is the walking distance uh, here i mentioned that the walking distance is variable in case of neurogenic claudication whereas it is constant in case of vascular claudication what i mean by variable is that uh, it will be varying with the each episode of uh, pain like for example uh, at one moment the patient will be able to walk uh, 200 uh, meters the next instance when he, when he is able to walk he'll be able to walk only 100 meters the, the subsequent uh, thing he'll be able to even able to walk around 300 meters so it is variable the claudicate distance variable whereas in vascular claudication typically like after 200 meters he will get a pain and it is going to be constant of course with the increase in severity of the vascular problem it will it is going to gradually reduce also but with, with each episode it is going to vary it's going to be variable in case of neurogenic claudication and similarly the radiation is in vascular neurogenic claudication it begins proximally and progresses distally whereas in vascular claudication it begins in the calves and works up proximally now uh, uh, what about cervical myelopathy which you can also encounter in your uh, practice as well as you can also have it in examination here the neurological symptoms are very uh, well i mean less well defined hence uh, we, we are bound to miss these uh, diagnoses uh, so can the, these patients may come with a history of 
uh, just a numbness or feeling of clumsiness or weakness in the hand. Uh, and they have uh, features of poor hand dexterity. For example, the patient may not be able to uh, button or unbutton her shirt. So this is how I uh, examine a patient and uh, find out whether they have uh, any uh, features of cervical myelopathy. Similarly, in lower extremities, there may be a sense of imbalance uh, and uh, there may be difficulty in ambulation or feeling of global weakness. And there, these patients may also present with the uh, features of uh, urinary frequency or urgency. And if it's going to be a very severe case, most florid cases can present with urinary and fecal incontinence. Uh, but of course, uh, the absence of market pain often leads to a lengthy delay in the diagnosis. So most often, uh, these uh, cervical myelopathy patients, uh, they have a delayed diagnosis. Uh, adding with the spinal stenosis in the lumbar spine, the neurologic symptoms uh, uh, can be um, and these patients with present with pain in the buttocks uh, or going on to the legs or uh, they can present with both buttocks and leg pain and with this which may be diffuse and vague and there may be numbness and the feeling of paresthesia in the legs and the feet and there may be altered bowel and bladder function in severe stenosis. Of course, Cordoicana syndrome, I think all of us are familiar that it presents with a bowel and bladder dysfunction or both and there may be saddle anesthesia and a variable loss of motor and sensory function of the lower extremities. Now, this is regarding the pain. Now, coming to the deformity, the next common uh, complaints for which a uh, patient comes to with spinal ailment is spinal deformity. That you, know, you got to uh, inquire regarding the duration of the deformity, whether it's present since birth or when did it really start. Like, for example, in case of spondylolisthesis, suddenly there may be a shortening of the individual. Like, uh, so that it can present deformities there. So that means that it, there's a progression of the deformity there. And there's any ask for any change, recent change in the fitting of the clothing or changes in the size of the clothing, which indicates a progression of the deformity or whether there's a loss of height, like for example, osteoporosis or in case of high grade spondylitis, all these conditions can have loss of height. And a very most important, as far as the spinal deformity is concerned, you've got to uh, ascertain the emotional and the psychological impact of a market cosmetic deformity. Because that may that there is, there is an emotional or psychological impact on these patients and that has to be clearly documented. Now, a good medical history is a must uh, to rule out the various other conditions like what I meant as the uh, visorogenic cause for pain. And that has to be because these, these can present as uh, uh, spine related, something like spine related pain, like presenting the back pain or pain in the uh, mid back or pain in the uh, neck and the shoulder region. So this will mimic a, a spinal ailment. Hence, you've got to have a good medical history to rule out all the visorogenic causes for pain, presenting, with the referred, uh, presenting as a referred pain. Psychiatric illnesses, particularly depression, clearly play an important role in the approach to treatment because this is going to affect not only the recovery of the patient, but also uh, uh, in, uh, where there are secondary gain issues, you've got to be very careful about uh, uh, these patients and you've got to have a good psychiatric illness also in these cases. Now, the social history, like you've got to uh, go into the type of work because uh, it is not enough that you treat these patients alone, but you've got to also uh, instruct them on the modifications of the lifestyle, like the way of working. Like, for example, a person who is going to uh, uh, work in IT field, like you got to advise them that you got to uh, modify your uh, uh, the chair which you use, and then you got to relax yourself in between, and then you got to do special um, spinal strengthening exercises. And uh, sometimes you might even have to, like, say, for example, the back pain is very common in the uh, two wheeler uh, uh, users, and you might have to want them that you've got to give up uh, using the two wheelers. So there's such, uh, um, uh, you got to take such social histories uh, uh, so as to advise the patients on the modifications of the lifestyle. And you also should go into the, whether there's history of use of alcohol or tobacco, which also has a bearing on the uh, spinal ailments. And most importantly, any secondary gain issues should be explored because a person who want to, uh, like these are the patients who are going to malinger and then for various secondary gain issues. And that has to be kept in mind. Now, the family history, strong familial history is associated with adolescent idiopathic scoliosis, and this allows for proper counseling of the family members. Now, uh, also, history should go into the comorbidities because, like, for example, if there is going to have a patient is going to have a cardiac problem that is going to have an effect on your uh, uh, surgical procedure, like you've got to be prepared for various uh, uh, precautions as far as these uh, patients are concerned. So you've got to go into the various comorbidities, then allergies, and also Previous treatment history is very, very important because you should not repeat the same treatment which has been given uh, by your the other uh, uh, doctor. So you got to go into the previous treatment history and that will really uh, help you in planning or uh, treatment uh, for uh, these patients which you are going to come across. Now, ultimately, by the end of the history taking, we should have a firm diagnosis or at least a differential diagnosis and then proceed accordingly, uh, both the examination as well as the 
uh, evaluation, radiological evaluation. Now coming to the clinical examination, like I'll stop here. Are there any questions as far as this is concerned uh, regarding history is concerned? If there are no questions, I'll just go ahead. Any any question from PGTs? Pulak, Pulak, have you joined? Have I missed anything like uh, the uh, history, right. like which you would like to know? No, I, I think you continue. Yes, In sir. the meantime, whatever question comes, I will yeah. give it to you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Now, the uh, going into the clinical examination, uh, like uh, you should, first of all, uh, introduce yourself to the patient and then you should ask a permission to perform the examination. I think this is what uh, we lack in our country, but I've uh, seen various uh, uh, um, like the students in various countries where uh, before even a consultant takes the permission of the patients to examine them. So I think it's a good habit. We should uh, uh, develop this culture in taking permission from the patients to exam perform the examination and explain the uh, patient appropriately what you are going to do. Like, And tell the patient to let you know if anything that you do is uncomfortable or painful. And especially in female patients, make sure that a female nurse or assistant is present all the time during your examination. Now, in general, you start your examination, general examination from the head to the toe examination has to be done. You got to look for any neurocutaneous markers, uh, look for any generalized ligament laxity and uh, 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 look for the trunk limb ratio. Like uh, you, it might give a clue as to the presence of Marfan syndrome. Look for the foot deformities. A final ailments can present with foot deformities due to neurological involvement. Hand deformities, like for it could be an arthrogryphos or you can also have a radiculopathy presenting with the hand deformities. And then you've got to look for any lymphadenopathy, uh, which gives a clue, a clue as to the disease process. Now, starting with the, uh, as far as the spine examination is concerned, starting with the observation, uh, what about uh, inspection is good for the look for the neurocutaneous markers. It could be a hairy patch, as you can see here in the midline here. It could be a hairy patch there, or it could be a midline lipoma or a cafeolia spots, as you can see here. And these are indicative of underlying spina, uh, 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 spinal ailments, like it could be a spina bifida, diastomatomalia, neurofibromatosis, uh, uh, when there's a presence of cafeolia spots, or it could be a tethered spinal cord. So next is uh, the gait. This is the first step of the examination. Ensure that the patient has reasonable power in the lower limbs to assess the gait. And, uh, and you got to, because uh, you got, only if there's a power the patient will be able to, if there is no enough power, better you do not perform this uh, gait examination. You can in, even tell the, ex uh, tell the examiner that you are not performed this because of the want of power. Uh, and if the patient is able to walk, you can also provide assistance if needed. And if there is impending neurology deficit, then assessment of need gait should be absolutely avoided. Now, uh, starting with the first when, uh, commonly encoded one is the myelopathic gait, uh, as you can see here. So involvement of the spinal cord here, you can have, uh, uh, in case of compression of spinal cord, you, you will have a, what you call as ataxic gait, which is a wide based, uh, clumsy, staggering gait with a lot of unsteadiness. And in fact, most of them use support to walk and uh, you should suspect in these cases, cervical and thoracic spine pathologies. The second one is the tandem tandem gait or tandem walking you got to look for. So this uh, elicits the subtle signs of- exam is evaluating for cerebellar and proprioceptive problems. I'm going to have you walk heel to toe about four or five steps. Okay, now stop. Come right back and start over again. We're going to do it with your eyes closed. So first you start with eyes open and then eyes closed also. This is what is your tandem walking. Good. Yeah. This elicits subtle signs of imbalance or lack of coordination, especially present in the case of uh, myelopathies. Now, uh, that uh, Trendlenburg's don't think that Trendlenburg's grade is present only in case of hip pathologies. Uh, it can also be present in spinal ailments. Uh, uh, Trendlenburg grade in spinal ailment may be due to weakness of the gluteal muscles, uh, the supply uh, being the L5 supply. Uh, and you can see here, it can present with the proximal myelopathy. This is the patient of a, uh, acute uh, lumbar disc disease, involvement of the L5 root on both sides, presenting with the uh, Trendberg's gated weakness of the gluteus medius. Yeah, that's it. So he's got weakness there and then. And this patient recovered fully after uh, doing a discectomy. 
Now, high stepping gait may be there uh, when there's a loss of the dorsiflexion of the ankle, especially in case of L5 nerve root disease. Uh, and this may be associated with uh, L5 dermatome sensory loss also. And similarly, antalgic gait, when there's a severe pain radiating to one limb, uh, there may be an antalgic gait, which is characterized by a short stance phase. And uh, any condition that cause pain in a lower extremity or a foot pain such as sciatica and can produce an antalgic gait. So you remember all these things now. So this is uh, regarding the gait. These are the few gates we, we, we are going to come across as far as spine is concerned. Now, coming, continuing with the clinical examination, the patient should change it into an appropriate gown or other cover. You've got to expose the entire sp spine and boys can have a leave off the uh, hospital gown. The girls can have the back of the gown moved aside for proper examination while maintaining modesty. At the same time, during evaluation, however, the chest should be examined to rule out any deformity. Now, uh, we will start first with the uh, cervical spine examination. Uh, starting with inspection, you've got to look for the position of the head, whether there's a presence of a head tilt, uh, which also indicates a lot of pathologies. The patient is seated and the neck is viewed from the front sides and the back. And uh, uh, in, uh, there may be a head tilt, what you call torticollis. Uh, in, conditions, in conditions like muscular uh, disorders like traumatic injury or inflammation of the sternum muscle or you should rule out a cerebellar dysfunction or congenital scoliosis can present with the head tilt, Atlanta axial instability or any even ophthalmic disorders can produce uh, torticollis. And uh, look for the short neck and low hairline which is indicative of congenital disorders. What is your clipple fail syndrome? You can have a short neck and a low hairline. And next is the palpation. Palp, uh, the vertebral levels uh, in the neck correspond to the various uh, spinal levels here. Now, like for example, C3 level uh, with the hyoid bone, which can palpate anteriorly just below the mandible. Similarly, C4 and 5 is uh, corresponding to the thyroid cartilage. And C6 level corresponds to the arch of the cricoid cartilage. Continuing with palpation, you should look for tenderness in the spinous process or the interspinous ligaments, which, which may be indicative of a fracture or acute ligamental injury. A shift in the spinous process has to be, uh, the, the alignment has to be looked for. Uh, for example, it, there may be a shift in the alignment uh, in case of unilateral facet dislocation or in the cases of spinous process fractures. And uh, note that prominent C2 spinous process is indicative of atlantoaxial subluxation. Now, uh, you should also look for tenderness in the uh, trapezius and the medial border of scapula, which might indicate a cervical disc herniation or a facet arthrosis, cervical facet arthrosis. The next one is the movement. You've got to look for the movement here. And this is mainly helpful in monitoring the response to treatment. Like, for example, when you start the treatment, the, the movement will be lesser. And as he's recovering, you will see that the movement also increases. And uh, these are the various degrees of movements you can see here. I do not go into details of each one of them. Like, you can see that uh, the uh, flexion would be uh, the, normally the patient will be able to uh, approximate the ch uh, chin without the chest and uh, in extension you have around four finger breaths from the uh, back of the neck. Uh, lateral uh, flexion is around 45 degrees on either side and lateral rotation is around 80 to 90 degrees on either side. Now coming to the neurologic evaluation in, uh, in spine, cervical spine disorders, a careful neurologic examination of the upper extremities is an essential part of the physical examination of cervical spine. And the nerve roots of the cervical spine, remember this, the nerve roots of the cervical spine exit above the pedicle of the corresponding numbered vertebrae until first thoracic level. For say, for example, if it's going to be a C7, uh, C6, 7 level, uh, the C6 root will be exiting above and the C6, 7, you will have the C7 root which is exiting there. So you should remember that, whereas in uh, the uh, lumbar level, it's quite different. I'll be telling about that uh, when I'm going to discuss about the lumbar level. So uh, you should look for the characteristic sensory motor and the reflex activity at each reach, each level is assessed. Uh, of course, the uh, motor uh, grading, the uh, motor testing is done by the muscle grading, uh, grading the power by the MRC grading. Uh, I do not want to go into it. It's about zero to five, you've got to grade them. The sensory examination, very important. You've got to test for the light, light touch and pinprick sensation, each cervical and the upper thoracic dermatome. And the proprioceptive testing is done at the level of the thumb. And the vibration sensors are tested in the distal radius, head of the ulna, medial, and the lateral epicondyles. Testing of the proprioception and the vibratory sensor may be helpful when a neuropathy or posterior column disorder is suspected. Now we'll go to each level now. So the C3 level, uh, there are no motor weakness or no reflex changes, and the pain radiates to the back of the neck and the, towards the mastoid process and the pin of the ear. C4 level, there is no motor weakness or no reflex changes, and the pain radiates to the back of the neck and superior aspect of the scapula. And one important thing, uh, examination, the scapulohumeral reflex. Uh, this is if the, if the scapula elevates or the humerus abducts, uh, it is termed a hyperactive reflex suggesting an 
upper motor neuron dysfunction above the C4 cord level. See, what has been found that uh, any disorder above the uh, base of skull or any disorder below the C4 level, we are having uh, uh, clear uh, motor uh, symptoms as well as reflex changes occurring. Whereas the region between C1 to C4, there are no clear cut uh, uh, um, neurological findings which uh, uh, pinpoints that the lesion is that level. So here, the scapulohumeral reflex is very useful in, in uh, locating the lesion in this level. So this is what is meant by the uh, scapulohumeral reflex. You just tap it over the uh, spine of the scapula, and you can see that the scapula elevates or the there's abduction of the shoulder. So this is very useful in pinpointing the lesion between the C1 to C4 level. Now C5 level, I think this, I think it's given in all the textbook. I think I need not go into details about each one of them. Uh, C5 have typical features like motor is the C5 uh, supplied roots like the uh, deltoids, especially most importantly, and the reflex is the biceps reflex and sensation is in the uh, outer aspect of the arm. What do you call it? The regimen batch sign if there is a numbness there. C6 is the uh, motor wrist extensors and the biceps flexors, and the reflex is the pericardialis, and sensation is over the outer aspect of the radial aspect of the forearm. C7 is uh, uh, triceps, motor power is triceps, and the wrist uh, flexors and finger extensors, and then you have the reflex is the uh, triceps uh, jerk, and C7 sensation is over the door, uh, a triangular, inverted triangular area in the palm of the hand, and C8 is uh, uh, the uh, motor introsia, uh, uh, the abduction and the adduction of the uh, fingers, as well as the hand grip, which tests the flexors of the hand. And sensation is over the uh, inner aspect of the uh, forearm, the ulnar border of the forearm. T1 is the motor is the introsia muscles again, once again here. And sensation is over the inner aspect of the arm there. That is T1. So this is how I remember, like in my PG period, I used to remember it like this. C5, uh, you can just note it down. C5 is the abductors. C6 is the flexors of the elbow and the extensor, wrist extensors. C7 is the elbow uh, extensor and wrist flexors. C8 is a hand grip and T1 is the adduction abduction of the fingers. So the easy to remember this, you can pinpoint the level based upon this. And one very important thing that I have always noticed is uh, the mapping the dermatomes. Uh, so you, you are normally shown the entire body with the various dermatomes and looks very complicated. Don't look at that. Look at it that way. You just see the like. For example, I'm just showing the upper limb alone here now. You can see, as I told you, C5 is the region where what you call as a regiment batch. So you have the the uh, uh, people, the army, the uniform people, the army people. They have the regiment batches there, and that is a sign. If there is a numbness, there, just remember that. If there is a numbness there, you can call it the regiment batch sign. We call it. So that is the region where it's supplied by C5, and then C7 is the inverted V-shaped lesion. Uh, region in the uh, hand there. So then, uh, apart from that, so it, uh, C6 is between C5 and C7, and C8 is between T1 is over the inner aspect of the arm. So I don't think it's very difficult to remember it this now. So that is a dermatome. Now, a, a cervical spine uh, pathology is always uh, present with uh, human lesions, and you got to rule out human lesion uh, associated with cervical spine pathologies. It can present with the upper and lower extremity hyperreflexia, the presence of Hoffman sign, and a, a inverted radial reflex, which I'm going to show you now, and the presence of ankle clonus. What is a Hoffman sign? As you can see here, just flicking the tip of the middle finger, you, is not, uh, you observe the uh, index and the index and the thumb. So it goes to flexion. So this is what is known as a Hoffman sign, which is uh, clearly indicative of a human sign. And the inverted radial reflex, as you can see here, when you tap, uh, tap the radial shylord, you'll see that the wrist and the fingers go in for flexion. So this is the inverted radial reflex. And the ankle clonus, uh, ankle clonus is the rhythmic repetitive contraction of the ankle plantar flexors. Of the ankle is a rapidly dorsiflex and held in position. As you can see here, you should look for the ankle clonus. You should know how to elicit it. This is the way you elicit it. And it is quantified by counting the number of beats of clonus. And you should always look for whether it's a sustained clonus, which indicates of a uh, severe pathology. Now, uh, other uh, evidence for human findings are the Babinski's test, the Oppenheim's uh, sign, the finger escapes, and I'll just show you the finger escape sign alone because these are familiar with you. About the heart these are the finger escape sign. Release test. The patient will be unable to make a fist and a release 20 times in 10 seconds. Yeah. So, yeah, you should be able to at least do uh, 20 times per second. And this is the finger escape sign. 
uh, this is what you see. Like if you're going to put your fingers together, extend your fingers, you will see that the little finger uh, abducts. There you can see that that is not the finger escape sign. One another indication of it, evidence of human findings. See they were trying to hold it together, and you will see that the finger escapes. It abducts, abducts and extends also to some extent, and this is also a feature of human findings. And uh, there are special maneuvers uh, uh, associated with cervical pathologies. The spurling sign, where uh, you try to extend the uh, neck as well as uh, uh, flex it toward the say, side of pathology, you will see that there, there's production of symptoms, the pain, aggravation of pain, and the pain radiating down the upper limbs. And similarly, cervical compression test is quite uh, self explanatory. Like you uh, give axial pressure there, you will see that uh, the cervical compression increases and uh, production of symptoms, and it is lead by cervical distraction test. I don't think we commonly use these tests, but spurling sign may be useful in certain uh, uh, patients who are presenting with radiculopathy. The Lermut sign is a feature of cervical myelopathy, and it is an electric shock like sensation which occurs with the neck flexion and often radiates down the spine. And in some cases, the sensation goes to the extremities and is probably caused by hyperexcitability of the nerves, which become demyelinated. So that is the Lermut sign. And uh, the shoulder abdux, abduction relief sign, or what you call as the Davidson sign, is where uh, you uh, there's relief of symptoms of putting the uh, hand on the head, whereby you abduct the shoulders. So this may also help us in ruling out a shoulder pathology because most often uh, shoulder pathologies are associated with cervical pathologies also, like more patients might present with cervical spondylosis along with the periarthritis shoulder. So this will help us in ruling out a uh, shoulder pathology. And of course, the absence test, each one of us know, I need not repeat that, which is indicative of a uh, thoracic outlet syndrome. And uh, your cervical spine examination is not complete without examination of the shoulder and also examination uh, uh, pertaining to the uh, examination of the peripheral nerve entrapments. So this is regarding the cervical spine. Now coming to the examination of thoracic and the lumbar spine, uh, you should start with the, again, inspection, you should look for the spinal sagittal alignment. So like, for example, it may be a sway back. You should have, you may be having an extension of the spine like that, or it may be an increased lumbar low doses, which may be present in case of uh, uh, high-grade spondylolysis or thoracic kyphosis, like as in case of Schoolman's disease, or there may be forward head as in case of ankylos spondylitis. But a good posture is where if you draw a line through the uh, head, neck, shoulder, uh, elbow, skip, and the uh, it should pass through the heel. Uh, so that is what is known as a good posture. And we should look for all these uh, sagittal alignments. And then you should look for the alignment of the head. The head should be directly aligned over the sacrum. And any deviation from the midline may reflect a spinal deformity. Like this can be assessed by drawing a plumb line from the C7. So this is known as a plumb bob. I think you're supposed to have a plumb bob uh, in your examination. You're supposed to carry it. Uh, and this is help, this helps us in finding out the uh, head alignment. Uh, so any deviation of more than two centimeters from the natal cleft. See this, you can see a name, this, this is natal cleft area, you see a deviation there. So any deviation of more than two centimeters from the natal cleft, it may be a sign of underlying neural disease. And similarly, the shoulder uh, balance should also be looked for by drawing a line like that, a transverse line there. Now, uh, continuing with the inspection, you got to look for the, uh, the following things. You should remember this diagram here. The position of the head, as I started early, I mentioned earlier, the level of the hairline, low hairline is indicative of uh, any congenital spinal uh, disorders. Length of the neck, short neck is also again indication of a congenital disorders. Level of the shoulders, like in uh, spinal deformities, like scoliosis, you'll have an imbalance of the shoulders. The level of the scapulae, again, in spinal deformities, deformity, whether there's a presence of a gross deformity, like scoliosis, and the margin of the trunk, you should look for the margin of the trunk. Like, for example, if you see the margin here, you will see an unequal gaps between the arms and the trunk here. There's no gap here, whereas here there's a lot of gap there. This, again, is indicative of a spinal uh, a deformity. And uh, the, the spinous process, are there any prominent spinous process? You might have uh, uh, prominent spinous process in cases of uh, high-grade spondylolysis uh, or in the presence of a sp uh, spinal deformity following uh, tuberculosis. And then the level of the iliac crest, that gives us an idea about the, whether there are any uh, limb limb discrepancies or if there is a fixed spinal deformity and the uh, uh, examination dimple of the venous will be here now so that also again is indicative of a spinal uh, uh, deformity now the uh, subtle deformities may not uh, throw i uh, mean reveal the deformity present hence uh, this is the one test the adams forward bending test is a test which brings out the um, rotational deformity of the thoracic spine in the with the presence of a hump there and uh, in children the forward bending test 
uh, can be done over the examiner's legs or over the parent's legs while keeping the child's feet on the floor. You, the child may not be able to uh, listen to, I mean, uh, carry out your instructions. So hence, you can examine by asking them to lean forward over their parent's uh, um, um, thigh. And then, you, uh, as far as the spinal deformity is concerned, you got to uh, describe it whether it is a knuckle deformity or angular gibbous or is it a rounded gibbous. So knuckle is deformity is indicative of involvement of a single vertebrae. Angular gibbous is where two or three vertebrae are involved. And the round gibbous, uh, if there are more than three vertebrae, are involved. Rounded gibbous is uh, present in case of Schurman's disease. Angular gibbous is commonly found in uh, tuberculous lesions. And of course, knuckle is also when there's involved a single vertebrae, you can have a knuckle deformity again in tuberculosis. Now, the paraspinal muscles will, has to, will have to be taken into consideration in the examination again. Uh, if there is going to be asymmetrical spasm, it's indicative of discodural or discoradicular problems, whereas spasms of both the sacrospinalis muscles indicate of uh, serious disorders like metastasis or spinal infection. Now, paraspinal muscle uh, wasting may be found in case of chronic inflammatory diseases like tuberculosis, or ankylosis, spondylitis, poliomyelitis, myelopathies, uh, myopathies, or on previous spine, uh, following previous spine surgeries due to the DNA remission. So, this is a case of a uh, uh, spinal. Uh, this is following a po uh, patient who was undergone a spinal surgery. Uh, with probably a lot of denervation of the muscles leading on to wasting on the muscles, you are, you are able to see all the implants there. Similarly, lower muscle wasting has to be looked for. It, it, this may be found in L5 and S1 root palsies and for in chronic hip pathologies. Now, palpation uh, of the uh, in the lumbar spine region, like you got to look for the palpate, the bony elements and the paraspinal muscles, and also the various soft tissues, it's typical, especially the uh, the sacroiliac joint palpation, the sacro sciatic notch. Sometimes the patient might be having a, a tumor in the sci sciatic nerve, which can present as a mass in the sciatic notch region, and that has to be, this will be mimicking a sciatica. And uh, uh, again, you go to examine the abdominal musculature, uh, looking for any flabbiness, uh, which may be indicative of a thoracic uh, spine pathology, or presence of abdominal organomegaly and uh, rectal examination, belly examination must. And uh, you will have to mention the examination that whether you have done a, a rectal or pelvic examination. And uh, coming to the palpation, you got to look for the palpable step of sign. What is the palpable step of sign? Is the prominence of the spinous process. So this is one another one example um, and question which is commonly asked examination is uh, which spinous process are you feeling in cases of uh, a degenerative spondylolisthesis or in case of ischemic spondylolisthesis? So you, there are there are two cases which are going to be kept in exam. It could be a degenerative spondylolisthesis or a, a ischemic or lytic spondylolisthesis. In cases of uh, lytic, as you can see here, in cases that you can see the lysis there, in cases of lytic spondylolysis, uh, the entire spinous, the body along with the uh, spine above, it moves forwards, leaving behind the spinous process. So it is this uh, spinous process, what you feel is the spinous process of the body which is displacing forwards. Whereas, because it leaves behind the uh, spinous process. Whereas in case of degenerative spondylolysis, uh, the uh, body slips forwards along with the spinous process. So you will be able to feel the spinous process of the vertebrae below that. So that you got to tell clearly, like in case of degenerative spondylosis, it is the uh, spinous process which is present below the displaced uh, vertebrae that you're feeling. So this is one person which is commonly asked in the examination. And then you got to look for the movements of the uh, lumbar spine. Of course, you, you got to, uh, in uh, uh, describing the movement of the lumbar spine, you, are, you should remember that there is also movement of the hip taking place, hip joint taking place uh, when you're examining movements of the lumbar spine. So you got to uh, ask for the forward bending, lateral bending and backward bending. So in forward bending, you can just describe it how far the uh, hand reaches forwards, uh, I mean down, like you can say that it's reaching up to the knee or below the knee. Uh, and similarly on the lateral bending also, you can say how much see uh, your hand reaches on the sides. And uh, Coming to the measurements, you finish your inspection, then the palpation, then the, you have done the movements, and then you're coming to the measurements. So these are the following things you're going to measure in case of lumbar spinous cancer. Uh, it is a Schober's test, the limb length risk measurements, the costocrustal distance. Uh, the co uh, I'm going to describe the Schober's test, the limb length risk measurements later. The costocrustal distance is uh, it may be reduced in case of spinal deformity and high grade spondylolysis. So if you there is a normally a, around four to five finger breaths. Uh, space between the uh, costal margin and the iliac, uh, 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 iliac crest. So this may be decreased in case of spinal deformity or in high-grade spondylolysis. Similarly, the calf and the thigh muscle measurements has to be uh, done to rule out uh, wasting as in case of myopathies or for even radiculopathies. 
and just expansion is very very important uh, any uh, decrease just expansion is going to be less than uh, 5 centimeters it is indicative of ankylosing spondylitis now coming to show busters they, this is one question which is asked in examination they'll ask you what is a show busters now we normally follow the modified show bus test so initially the show bus test was uh, used to assess the lumbar spine alone the movement of the lumbar spine alone as i told you earlier when you are testing for the movements of the spine you are testing the along with that there is a movement occurring at the hip joint also if you want to purely like assess the movement occurring at the lumbar spine you got to do the show bus test so what the original show bus test uh, was done to uh, examine the movement occurring between l1 to l5 but uh, uh, later they observed that uh, the um, most of the movement is occurring between l5 and s1 so that was also to be taken into consideration hence uh, they uh, described the modified schober test so the schober test is where which is uh, done by uh, marking a point at the level of the uh, a dimple of venus and then a point 10 cm from uh, that and then uh, ask him to bend forwards and then you got to measure it it should be around 5 uh, 5 cm of increase in the uh, length then uh, the modified show bus test is where you got you are also taking into consideration the movement occurring at the l5 s1 also uh, like it will be extending from 5 cm uh, uh, you mark a point at the level of the dimple of venus or the uh, uh, iliac crest line post iliac crest and then you got to mark a point 5 cm below this and one another point 10 cm above that so, so that you, if you add these two the total length would be around 15 cm and then asking the patient to bend forwards there should be increase of around 5 cm so from 15 to 20 should work 20 cm and that is a normal uh, range of movement of the lumbar spine so this basically the showbers and the modified showbert test are done to assess the movement of the uh, purely the lumbar spine uh, uh, avoiding the movement occurring, occurring at the hip joint now you should also as i told you like this scoliosis can occur secondary to lengling discrepancies and it is corrected by a block beneath the short extremity so hence you got to Uh, do a measurement of the length. You should rule out a leg leg length discrepancy uh, in cases of scoliosis. Okay, I will mask up for a bit. Now the uh, coming to neurologic examination, the thoracic uh, starting with thoracic cord and the roots. Thoracic motor function is assessed by performing a partial sit up. Like there is involvement of the cephalad portion of the uh, abdomen. Uh, I mean abdomen wall. The cephalad portion abdomen wall supplied by the T5 to T10 roots. The caudal portion of the abdomen wall is supplied by T11 and L1. T11 to L1. So they they were going to do the partial sit up. A patient form uh, performs it by uh, trying to sit up partially, and there's weakness isolated to the one of the one side. The umbilicus moves in the contralateral direction. Uh, so this is what is known as a positive Bieber sign. So I think you should know of the Bieber sign. And the sensory dermatomes here, you can see that the level of the umbilicus is the D10, level of the nipple is a T4 or D4, and the just above the inguinal ligament is the T12. And the intervening areas like you got to just mark it like that. So that's quite easy remembering the. Dumb dumb pattern here also. Now, uh, uh, as far as the assessing the thoracic and the roots, the, the abdomen reflex is very useful in assessing these Now, uh, level. Now, the abdominal reflex. See how it is being done. Largely through the end of a pointed, but not sharp instrument across the four quadrants of the abdomen. Yeah, you should assess you for the contraction of the muscles there. The pointed end of the patella hammer. Yeah, do not use any sharp Avoid equipment. Don't hurt the there. patient's skin, as the abdomen is a tender area. A normal reaction would be contraction of the abdominal muscles. Yeah. Remember so that this is the dermatomal pattern here. By T10. Any absence the of the abdominal reflex indicative of a uh, thoracic spinal segment uh, involvement. And then the cremastic reflex. This tests the integrity of the uh, T12 and the L1 uh, neurological levels. So the, the, the bilateral absence of this response indicative of UM lesion, and the unilateral absence indicative of uh, uh, involvement of the uh, L1 and L2 level uh, roots alone. Now uh, the uh, bulbous uh, cavernous reflex is very important. Uh, this is uh, uh, the anal sphincter relies on the innervation uh, of S2 to S4 level, and then this is done by uh, the rectal examination and evaluate the spe- uh, anal sphincter tone, and then you try to perform the reflex by uh, giving a slight traction on the Foley's catheter or by compressing or squeezing the plan uh, penis or the gl- uh, clitoris, and you uh, how to interpret it. Uh, like you will feel that there's a contraction of the uh, anal sphincter, so this is absent in case of uh, spinal shock. It will absent in case of spinal shock, and once uh, the um, bulbous canal is reflex, then it indicates that the spinal uh, shock is uh, uh, absent. So it is uh, it, the patient. You should say that this patient has recovered from the spinal shock, and this is indicative of a severed spinal cord. So one day then after that, you should be able to. Uh, 
do the detailed neurology examination before the, in the if you are going to do a neurology examination during the spinal shock uh, the, or the before the return of the bulbo cavernous reflex you may not be able to assess the true neurological uh, status of the patient now coming to the various levels again as we saw in the cervical region uh, starting with the l1 l2 l3 level the motor is the iliosovas and you can see how it is being done here now how to test the iliosovas so i'm not going to detail for want of time and similarly the uh, l2 3 4 levels testing the quadriceps and here again you can see how uh, the quadriceps is tested uh, i think these you can read in your uh, textbooks there the l4 level is uh, involvement of tibialis anterior the motor is the uh, l4 level is tibialis anterior testing and the knee jerk uh, and the sensation is over the inner aspect of the uh, leg now similarly l5 you got uh, got examine the uh, ehl and sensation is over the uh, dorsum of the foot and the outer aspect of the leg also here now a very important thing is that the it may be presenting with the positive trendelenburg test um uh, you uh, normally we see the weakness for the uh, weakness of the extensor hallux longus but you should also look for the uh, presence of uh, trendelenburg sign uh, which is indicative of weakness of the gluteus medius involvement with the, uh, due to the involvement of the l5 root uh, s1 is uh, the motor is the peroneus uh, muscles and then the reflex is the ankle jerk and sensation is over the uh, outer aspect of the dorsum of the foot as well as the i'm going to show it in the uh, mapping there so this is how you remember uh, the uh, motor power root values uh, you can see like uh, upper limb we were able to pinpoint one uh, root alone whereas in lower limbs we are uh, we cannot uh, pinpoint it like that so like uh, what i do is you start with l2 3 draw the diagram like this uh, just remember this picture there l2 3 l4 5 then uh, the knee level one knock off l2 there so you start with l3 l4 l5 and s1 when you come to the ankle take off this l3 there you start with l4 l5 s1 s2 so you just add l1 and l2 here so the flexors of the hip is l1 l2 and l3 extensor is l4 l5 similarly the extension of the knee is by l2 3 4 flexion is by l5 s1 similarly dorsiflexion of the ankle is l4 5 plantar flexion is s1 s2 ehl is l5 and fhl is s1 so any if so say for example there's involvement of the l5 root you will have weakness of the uh, dorsiflexor of the ankle weakness of the ehl there may be weakness of the flexion of the knee as well as weakness of extension of the hip joint so this is how you uh, go about uh, based upon the root values similarly the dermatomes here again you need not be uh, worried about how you are going to map the dermatomes here so you can see like uh, the pocket area the what i said is uh, the pocket area is l1 if you keep your hands in the pocket that is l1 area the middle of the thigh is the l2 region the over the knee is l3 region inner aspect of the leg is the l4 region outer aspect of the leg and the dorsum of the foot is l5 small area on the dorsum of the foot and the central area of the leg up to the gluteal region is the s1 then 2 3 4 5 is the uh, around the what you call as the saddle area of the we get the saddle anesthesia there is around the anus there so this is quite easy in remembering the lower lower limb dermatomas also now the uh, uh, coming to neurological examination like uh, of the s2 3 and 4 roots the, this is the principal nerve supplied to the bladder and it also supplies the intrinsic muscles of the foot that's the reason why i told you in dental examination you should look for uh, foot deformities any involvement of these roots you can have foot deformities and uh, perianal sensation uh, uh, may be affected presenting with a saddle anesthesia and this mediates a superficial anal reflex also now the specialized maneuvers uh, like uh, to roll out the nerve root tension i think this is what is known as a sciatic stretch testing which you are uh, all of us are uh, familiar with and we will be going into each one of them uh yeah so like uh, the dynamics of the slrt like you should remember that from 0 to 35 degrees when you are going to lift it up there is a slack in the sciatic orbitation taking up during the stay range so there is no dural movement at all so anything like uh, from 0 to 35 uh, it may not be very significant at all uh, from 35 to 70 only the root uh, sciatic root tensions uh, are uh, exhibited and then it's very important that you got to interpret it uh, from 30 uh, from 35 degrees to 70 degrees and anything beyond 70 degrees also uh, any pain produced it may be due to the tightness of hamstrings it not be very significant so uh, the most important thing is from 35 to 70 degrees you got to look for any uh, pain uh, when you are performing this test there and uh, you one one other thing is you got to mention it you cannot just say that slrt is positive slrt is negative that is not the way to express it you got to say like Uh, slrt on the right side is 40 degrees painful or slrt on the left side is 60 degrees painful 
so that is how you should express it. And if it's going to be normal, you should say SLRT is uh, 80 degrees painless. So that means that it is normal. So only up to 80, 70 to 80 degrees when it's significant beyond that, it is not significant at all. Uh, then the uh, Bragard stress, where you do a dorsiflexion of the foot. That is a Bragard stress there when you're doing the test. See, uh, uh, dorsiflexion of the foot, that's a Bragard, when the pain is uh, aggravated, you call it a Bragard stress. And the Lessigo this is this is what is a Bragard stress there. And the SLR test, of course, the Lessigo stress is the SLR test there. Now, the boasting test is when you apply pressure over the lateral popliteal now, uh, like uh, having the uh, knee uh, flexed 5 to 10 degrees after eliciting the SLRT, if it produces pain, then it's again indicative of a uh, sciatic uh, no, uh, irritation, root irritation. Now, the uh, cross leg or the well leg straight leg raising test is very important. I think this also uh, indicates severity of the disorders. A very high incidence of uh, uh, sequestration or extrusion is seen in all patients uh, who are presenting with cross leg pain. So, what is the a basis for this, uh, you can just see here, uh, supposing it's going to be a, a location of the disc in the axilla, or in such cases, if you're going to do a SLRT on the unaffected side, this in, track, in turn will produce a traction on the uh, spinal cord as such, and it's going to uh, pull the uh, uh, spinal, I mean, the neural structures down, and this will produce a pain. So this is known as the cross leg or the well leg raising test. As I told you, uh, most of these uh, uh, patients who are presenting with sequestration or extrusion uh, will have a positive cross leg raising test. It also indicates the severity. And then the femoral stress test, of course, this is how you do the femoral stress, which indicates of a root uh, value L234 roots involvement. This is similar to sciatic nerve stress, then very important to see how it is being performed there. So you've got to stabilize the pelvis there and then perform it. And see how he's holding the limb also. It's very important how we do it. Yeah, anterior thigh can present with the uh, anterior thigh pain if it's going to be positive. So that is the femoral stretch test there. And then uh, your examination is not complete. They're performing examination of the sacral leg joint there. So these are the various tests here. The Faber test. You can see that this is how you perform it. Putting the uh, foot on the opposite knee. Uh, stabilizing the pelvis, very important, you got to stabilize the pelvis and then rock the sacroiliac joint there. So that is how you, so you're, you're, he is testing on the right side and that is a, the, how you rock the right sacroiliac joint by performing the Patrick or the Faber test. And the Gansel okay, test is a little more crude, crude here. So you got to stabilize the pelvis there by putting the leg out of the uh, couch. Firm pressure yeah. to the knee being flexed to the patient's chest and a counter pressure is applied to the knee of the hanging leg. So you got to do it this way and you are testing the, that's how you rock the uh, uh, pathology side. Put the edge of the tape. Yeah. And then uh, other tests are the compression test, the lateral compression. You can just put the patient on the side and trying to exert lateral compression and distraction also. So pressure on the uh, antisubiliac spines and pressure on both sides, you can distract the pelvis there by uh, rocking the sacroiliac joint there. The other ones I've described already now. Now, you've got to correlate between the spinal and the vertebral uh, segments. Very important, especially this is uh, maybe asked in the uh, uh, carry spine. Uh, you're not going to be kept a, a case of a, a active tuberculous lesion with the neurologic deficit, but of course, you'll have a, a healing lesion uh, or a recovering lesion. I mean, a recovering um, a lesion. So, you, so you've got to determine the level. So the vertebral level will not correspond uh, 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 to the corresponding neurological level. So you got to say, well, what is the vertebral level? And then you got to uh, correlate with the neurological level also. Like for example, if it's going to be upper dorsal levels, you got to add two segments. Say for example, if it's going to be uh, a lesion in the D2, uh, you got to add two segments. So the neurologic level would be around two, four, D4. Similarly, in the uh, lower dorsal level, you got to add three segments. And if it's going to be vertebral level is D10, D11, if there's a, uh, you feel that there's a, a D11 uh, level, uh, then it, it corresponds to L3-4 segments and D12 vertebrae corresponds to L5 segment and the L1 corresponds to the sacral and the coxial segments. And then you got to, uh, so this is a must in case of, uh, uh, also part of the clinical examination. So uh, finally, you got to complete the examination with examination of the KIPS uh, pelvic girdle and the vascular system. Very important. You got to feel for the peripheral pulses and then you got to control the exam because the patients with the uh, any vascular insufficiency in the lower limbs can present with uh, symptoms, something like a, a spine pathology. So you got to conclude with the vascular examination. Thank you. So this is in short uh, regarding the examination of the spine. So I, I had to rush through because for want of time, you know, like I want to 
uh, reduce as much time as possible in that as rushing through. Thank you. Sir, sir, you have to unmute yourself. It's an excellent talk. I hello, think there hello. must be some... Hello, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Very good to hear you, sir. From... Uh... PGT, any PGTs, any question from examination part or previously from history, any part? If, if you have anything to ask or nearly sub, then please ask. And before that, Professor Nelly. Yes, sir. Uh, I have observed that many examiners have different likings about the elicitation of uh, to how to elicit the quadriceps, knee jerk, ankle jerk, ankle clonus, knee patellar clonus, etc. Different types, and yes, uh, they do not they do not like this method, that method, like this. What is the standard method that you should practice or students will practice? I think uh, I thought uh, that's going to be too basic, and that's the reason why I not put the, those videos there. <laughs> uh, like. Um, you want to know the uh, what specifically is there like? Ah, I'll tell you. As far as reflex are concerned, uh, mm -hmm. the knee hammer. What the most important thing is the knee hammer you're going to have with you. So mm -hmm. do not have the the stiff ones there. You will have the the plastic one with the uh, uh, the tip, which is uh, uh, the, the the handle should be very flexible, so that you should just give a tap there. You should be able to elicit. Just give a jerk there, and do not place the knee hammer on the disc and just hold on to that. You should just mm -hmm. give it, just a tap there and take your uh, hammer off. So in, in the knee hammers with the flexible handles can give that jerk there. And that is the most ideal one. For examination, kindly carry the plastic handles ones, which are, which are very flexible and very long also. So that is very important. Do not carry the metallic uh, uh, knee hammers. In okay. metallic hammers, you should know how to use it. You should have that. The same thing has to be given in your... The wrist should be flexible there. And you uh -huh. got to uh, give that uh, jerk there with the wrist there. Whereas if you're going to use these plastic handle knee hammers, they are uh, very ideal for uh, performing the jerks there. So very important that you got to just give a jer uh, jerk there. That's it. Don't do it. Uh, don't uh, tap it and place it over the, uh, the ligament end there. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, good evening, sir. Siddharth here. Yeah, sir, yeah, sir. Question from uh, PGTs. Uh, one PG Diptendu uh, Ghosh from SSKM is asking, sir, can you please explain the palpatory difference between lytic and degenerative spondylolisthesis once more? Okay, okay. You want me to go back again? Just uh, you can, you can. Yeah, you can go back to the slides or you can just explain also the palpatory difference. Between the no, I think uh, by seeing the slide only you'll be able to nicely understand. Yes, I think that's a very important question also. Now in the examination, they're going to ask you this one. I'm sure you're going to any patient, uh, any uh, case which is going to mean uh, if they were to keep a spondylolysis case, they are definitely going to ask this question. So if you can see here, See, this is a lytic uh, spondylolysis. You can see the lysis there. Can you see that? Are you able to see the arrow? I'm going to. I'm moving there. Cursor there. Yeah. Yes, yeah, sir. Yeah. You can see, you can see the lysis there. In the case of a lytic spondylolysis, the body move, moves forwards along with the entire vertebral column above. So in that, such cases, you will see that the spinous process of the involved vertebrae is left behind. So you will be feeling the spinous process of the involved vertebrae. Whereas in case of degenerative spondylolysis, the body moves forwards along with the spinous process. So hence you will be feeling the vertebrae, which is just below the involved spi uh, vertebrae. The spinous process of the vertebrae, just below the involved vertebrae, that is the spinous process you're going to feel there. Do you understand now? I think you'll be able to understand clearly by this picture now. Yes, sir. It's because the spinous process, the involved order moves along with the vertebrae. So you will not be able to feel that. 
and this is the in your inspector find inspection you can see that how nicely you are able to see the step there and then you should be also be able to feel the step there so this is one question i think it's a good question actually and uh, this is this will be commonly asked in the examination yes mm -hmm. thank you so much sir there is one more question from uh, pulog yeah uh, he is uh, asking can you elaborate more upon spinal segments and vertebral ligaments ah yeah okay okay we'll go to that uh, yeah here uh, i think uh, the post graduate should remember that the vertebral column and the spinal cord are not of the same length so there is a lag between the uh, growth of the spinal cord and the uh, vertebral column so uh, in cases of a tethered cord there's a reason why in case of tethered cord where it is being uh, anchored to the distal part of the uh, vertebral column uh you have uh, a stretching of the spinal cord because of the growth of the vertebral column so that's the reason why we do a detethering so there is a lag in the growth of the spinal cord as compared to that of the vertebral column hence it stops at the level of l1 there so uh, so the vertebral level and the spinal cord level do not correspond to each other so that is how that is what we mean by you got to correlate between the spinal and the vertebral level segments so that is a, this is a formula which is being used here uh in case of cervical spine i should say you should add minus 1 in cervical spine you add minus 1 there whereas in upper dorsal it's like for example i told you know uh the uh, uh, roots in the cervical spine level will be just passing above the numbered vertebrae say for example if it's going to be c5 and c6 level so in this neural foramen you will have the c6 nerve root there because the c6 is the uh, vertebral vertebral level below no so the the c6 vertebrae the root passes above the pedicle of the c6 vertebrae whereas the lumbar level suppose it's going to be l5 root the l5 root passes just below the pedicle there so you should remember that so in l4 l5 level the l4 root passes below the pedicle that is exiting root there so in l4 5 you have the, the root which exiting is the l4 root in similarly l5 s1 below the pedicle of l5 the l5 root goes out so between in l5 s1 level you will the exiting root is the l5 root whereas in cervical level it pass above the pedicle say for example c5 c6 level the it will be a c6 which is a uh, position there the root is position there because the c6 root passes above the pedicle of the c6 vertebrae so similarly in case of dorsal region if it's going to be a say for example it's going to be a d2 level region up to d6 i am telling you the upper dorsal so if it's going to be d2 you should add 2 so d2 is the vertebral level if you say for example the tenderness at d2 level so you will have you should expect a lesion around d4 spinal segment okay similarly lower dorsal level like below c uh, d6 you should add 3 say for example if it's going to be d7 if there's a tenderness in the d spine uh, vertebral level you should expect a spinal level of d10 okay the spinal cord uh, level is d10 similarly if it's going to be d11 vertebral tenderness so it will be somewhere you should expect lesion somewhere in l3 4 uh, segment d12 is l5 segment and l1 is uh, both this uh, the sacral I mean, sacral and the coccygeal segments are located there so this is how you determine the level in your examination you got to say suppose a patient with the c7 uh, spinal segment lesion comes so it would be around the dorsal the vertebral level would be around uh, d3 d4 somewhere there so it may not uh, perfectly match there you should at least in your examination you got tell there and to some extent it should be uh, uh, correlating so that is what we mean by the uh, correlation between the spinal and the vertebral segments hope i am clear thank you sir thank you so much sir yeah. uh, thank you thank you sir anything any else, other sir? question or you can write it uh, any other questions if you have in your mind in the meantime uh, we can go back to ananda yes yes <clears throat> yes 
I am uh, ready, so I can uh, share my screen. As, as you have uh, time constraint, uh, can please? I can I request now, Doctor? Uh, yeah, no, yeah, yeah. I'll just uh, yeah. I will uh, stop sharing now. Yeah. Hmm? Doctor Silvaraj. Silvaraj. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay, Dr. Silvaraj, please. Yes, sir. Uh -huh. Can you can you start now, Silvaraj? Siddhar? Over, yes, over sir, to Silvaraj. Sense. Ananda. Oh, yeah. Okay, after, yes, sir. After that, we'll do it. Okay. 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 Now Silvaraj. Sir, my presentation is visible, sir. Yes sir. yes, sir. We can see your screen. Yeah. You can go on. Fine. Uh, this is going to be mostly an interactive uh, session, mainly aimed at the postgraduate's examination point of view. Yeah. I'm going to present a case scenario. I'll be putting questions across to the PGs. Those who are the PGs who joined the Zoom meeting, they can come up with their answers. Right. This is the X-ray of Mr. M. A 60-year-old male is a known diabetic. He sustained a grade one open segmental fracture of both bones, right leg, and was treated by debridement and interlocking nailing. Ten months after the surgery, the patient presented with first discharge with an unrelated fracture. Uh, this is the X-ray at the presentation. Now for the postgraduates. What will be the line of management that you'll adopt? Any of the postgraduates who are online can come up with the answer. Whatever you, you may commit a mistake also. This is the place where you can commit a mistake and learn. You want, it will be too costly to commit the same mistake in the exam. Okay, okay. That's, a, that's good. Uh, any postgraduate? Any, any postgraduate, please? Tendu, can you go with the case? Uh, the, the, sir, the, the line of management will start with the removal of implant, uh, since the, uh, that is the uh, main agent causing the infection. After that, since the uh, fracture is not united, uh, we can go for uh, sequential debridement with ex uh, external fixation uh, with local antibiotic delivery system anything, or any local antibiotic. Okay, and fine. Uh, why, do you, why do you want to remove the implant? Uh, yes, sir. I would like to remove the implant because uh, since it's the, uh, uh, I mean, uh, since it's uh, causing the infection, so I'd like to uh, remove the implant and send it for culture and sensitivity to look for the positive organism and and further uh, go for the antibiotic. Health. Yeah, one thing: the implant is a foreign body, right? It's a metal uh, which can uh, harbor or which can aggravate the infection that is already present. And the second thing that you must remember is, whenever there's an implant in position, uh, you have the formation of what is known as a biofilm or the glycocalyx. This is formed by the organism and it is like a fortress for the organism. The organism hides inside, it gathers its nourishment and your body's defenses, that is the phagocytic process cannot approach the organism and further your antibiotic even if you're going to pump in tons it will never penetrate and reach the penetrate the biofilm and reach the organism so it is very very important that when there is an infection in the presence of an implant the implant has to come out this is this doesn't hold good in the case of a early infection with an implant say you have a uh, infection after implant surgery within a week or 10 days, then the organism would not have time to form the biofilm. But if it is nine months, 10 months, where the organism has had a chance to form the biofilm, it's very, very important that the implant should come out and the biofilm should be completely removed. Okay. Now, the implant was promptly removed. The surgeon uh, did a culture and sensitivity, treated the infection, and then the second surgeon who saw the patient decided to do a plate and screw fixation. Now, is this the right management?
physicians can come out with their answer the second surgeon had decided to do a platen screw fixation after removal of the implant and apparently the infection had got control now if this surgery is to be done what are the criteria you will consider or what are the tests you will do before a second implant surgery is planned sir first uh, crp and esr has to be measured uh, okay, and only after, and only after confirming that uh, the levels are normal then only can proceed for the second surgery yeah you are talking about the investigations anything concerning with the patient there should be no local signs of infection like warm or any swelling fluctuant swelling and then the soft tissue condition should be normal yes. there should not be any unhealthy scars through which you can go in okay so this surgeon did the uh, implant surgery in the form of a plate fixation and due to the uh, belief reinfection occurred and then the implant was removed the patient was given a walking plaster thinking that uh, the fracture had united and what happened was there was a refracture at the distal side the proximal fracture site had healed and the distal fracture site gave way you can see the sclerotic bone ends with the definite fracture gap the esr and crp were elevated what will be your line of management at this stage and why there's a refracture at the distal side with an elevated esr and crp how will you proceed at this point of time sir uh, we can do a thorough reaming of the medullary cavity to burn out the okay. infection and uh, okay. also we'll put a uh, antibiotic laden uh, intramedullary nail what is the advantage of antibiotic coated uh, intramedullary nail sir uh, it will give a dual advantage uh, local uh, antibiotic uh, concentration will be higher as well as uh, there will be intramedullary fixation as well patient can walk walk also over that yeah fine i agree with your point an antibiotic coated nail will be a good option but only thing is if your antibiotic coated nail doesn't work after a point of time it stops eluding the antibiotic then it becomes a nail a foreign body against cement which doesn't elude any antibiotic and then you have a double problem inside and uh, removing a antibiotic coated nail in case the fracture hasn't healed within the expected time uh, it becomes a very difficult proposition sometimes no sir uh, sir i would uh, sir since esr and crp are already elevated uh, yeah. so there is already a persisting infection so i would rather avoid any sort of intramedullary implant or any yeah. so i'll go for a uh, limb re reconstructive uh, system i mean the lrs along with that we can go uh, go for a proximal corticotomy corticotomy to give a good compression at the fracture site and along with that a local antibiotic or good debridement yeah i think i i would agree with this because in the presence of an active infection uh, it is uh, very very uh, not so advisable to use an any in intramedullary device even if it is antibiotic coated one i would prefer an external fixer type where the infection will not be a problem and it can be done even in the presence of active infection and in a poor soft tissue condition as well now he you told lrs uh, now coming to the uh, theory part how do you classify a non union you told non union and infection how do you classify a non union 
Uh, non indian sir atrophic and hypertrophic and uh... correct atrophic and hypertrophic any other name for this the other one is it is hypervascular and avascular the hypertrophic ones have got good vascularity whereas the atrophic ones they lack proper vascularity so you can call it either way either hypertrophic or vascular atrophic or avascular have you heard about this dwarf pallis classification of non union it is a bit more elaborate i'll just show the slide this is what you told the atrophic and the hypertrophic varieties and then dwarf pallis he includes uh, presence of bone loss in the classification type a it can be lax where there is no uh, deformity possible because it is freely mobile you have hypermobility you can put it in the right position whereas a2 is stiff that means it is it can be stiff without deformity or it can be stiff a2 one no deformity a2 two is fixed deformity type b is there is a bone loss more than 1 cm either it can be just a bone gap without shortening or b2 can be no bone gap but there is shortening the fragments are approximate to each other and type b3 is bone gap and there is a shortening right in b1 this class is very simple in b1 you will not do a internal bone transport in b2 you have to do a corticotomy and do a bone transport as well as limb lengthening that is the uh, main difference in the management now for this patient we did the we pressured the bone ends and they did the elisora fixation and then you can see the wires are tented above and below placing the fragments in acute compression now what is the process by which this acute compression works elisora says that even if there is an interposition this fragments they will unite under acute compression what is the process by which even if there is an interposition these fragments unite any idea he calls it as transformation osteogenesis he says that under continued compression and continuous weight bearing even if there is a soft tissue interposition the soft tissue undergoes transformation into bone and it terms this as transformation osteogenesis now i heard that is the mention of a uh, corticotomy how do you define a corticotomy when you say corticotomy the examiner will ask you what is corticotomy any answers right corticotomy is a low velocity osteotomy where you preserve as much as possible the periosteal and the endosteal blood supply the osteotome you just pass through and through cut the bone uh, without bothering about the periosteal or the endosteal blood supply whereas in corticotomy you preserve the endosteal and periosteal blood supply to the maximum possible extent so that the formation of new bone will not be an issue right can you name a few indications for doing a corticotomy how does a corticotomy help in a non union and what are the other indications apart from non union where you will do a corticotomy In, uh, gap no, in gap non-union cases, when we do a corticotomy, uh, by the principle of principle of destruction histogenesis, it causes compression at the flexor side, and at the corticotomy side, there is gradual uh, formation of uh, over the time. Corticotomy, you can do when there is a bone gap or there is a shortening of the limb due to bone loss, 
right and then if the patient sometimes for cosmetic reasons patient come to you for limb lengthening procedures again it can be done and in infected non union elizaro claims that in the fire of regeneration that is caused by the distraction with the corticotomy side the infection gets burnt up that's what he says elizaro claims that and there have been studies to show that uh, the limb vascularity increases enormously after corticotomy and that is why corticotomy has been employed in certain cases of tao thromboembolic ablutrans also you can do a corticotomy to improve the vascularity of the limb and angiographic studies have shown that the limb vascularity considerably improves and the patient stops prodigating after a corticotomy is done for a tao right how do you manage a corticotomy after doing it just like that you do and then any protocol you are aware of managing a post corticotomy management now after doing a corticotomy the x ray in the x ray it look like an undisplaced osteotomy that's not been in translation or rotational deformity then you wait for roughly 5 days to a week this is known as the latency period you give this time so that the initial pause of healing has sufficient time to bridge the uh, gap between the two bone ends and then you start distracting at 1 mm per day ideally at quarter mm every 6 hours this is known as the rate and rhythm of distraction and you keep on distracting until you achieve the desired length okay now how is this how is this corticotomy different from a growth plate growth plate also throws new bone corticotomy also throws new bone is it any different from the growth plate that you normally have bone that develops in the corticotomy is it any different from a growth plate now i'll ask you what is the type of ossification in a new bone that is formed in a growth plate the epiphysis that throws new bone you know what is the type of ossification that occurs in a new bone formed by a growth plate right new bone the forms in a growth plate ossifies by endochondral ossification whereas the new bone that forms in a corticotomy ossifies by intramembranous ossification that's the basic difference and then you have to monitor the regenerate that forms very closely that should be the same diameter as that of the parent bone if it is thinner than the parent bone then you call it as a atrophic regenerate if it is bulging beyond the confines of the normal bone you call it as hypertrophic regenerate if it's an atrophic regenerate you have to slow down the rate of distraction if it is hypertrophic you have to increase the rate of distraction hypertrophic regenerate occurs in children and then in patients who have got an associated head injury whereas atrophic regenerate occurs when the construct is a bit unstable or the limb is uh, relatively avascular these are the indications for uh, this is the management of uh, corticotomy suppose you have done a corticotomy and distraction when will you plan to remove the uh, rings that should be end point you know if you do corticotomy and distract new bone has formed sufficiently and then when do you decide to remove the apparatus cilicer of frame or your lrs whatever it is you are employed for the limb reconstruction what will be the time or what will be the ideal time to remove the frame there are few parameters you take a ap and lateral view of the four cortices in the ap view you will see the medial and lateral cortex and in the lateral view you will see the anterior and posterior cortex of this at least three cortices should be well formed in ap and lateral views that is one parameter and if you have uh, facilities for a quantitative ct the region rate should have at least 70% of the bone density of the corresponding bone on the normal limb uninjured limb 70% of the 
strength of the bone on the other side if the regenerator has achieved then in these two instances you can plan to remove now what are the advantages of elisara operators over the lrs what are the advantages of elisara or lrs yeah of course elisara can provide a multiplanar stability whereas lrs is a uniplanar device so yeah that's one thing and if there is a deformity associated it is very very easy to correct the deformity gradually and fine tune it to the last degree with elisara and uh, both these frames lrs and uh, elisara they help you to do it even in the process of infection and then uh, weight bearing will not be an issue the patient can weight bear from uh, the first or second day whenever is comfortable and this permits the patient the patient morale becomes high the, by exercising the muscles are kept active the vascular to the fragments improve and the bone ultimately starts to heal now this was the final x ray you see the solid union with the trabecular crossing over uh, and this was the patient's clinical photograph now is the limb length normal or is the limb length different by looking at this picture can you tell the limb length is normal or different dr gosh dipten the gosh can you the limb length appears to be shorter because the patella they appears to be same at the patella is at the same level no you can see that the right lower limb is straight whereas the left knee is bent that means the right lower limb is a bit shorter that's why he is flexing the opposite knee this is an important clinical finding when the patient stands he will flex the normal knee so that his pelvis is square this is an important clinical point that you must remember okay right now this is uh, the case scenario of a infected non union of both bones leg these are the usual questions that are put across to the uh, pg students uh, sir ray sir any other question you would like to ask the pg trainees paul sir you can also join in that is excellent excellent this is uh, this uh, interactive session is very good exactly what we asked the examinees and the questions you rightly we have put and they should answer in that way and you will also uh, given the answers proper answer and the i think the students should be uh, prepared for that they will answer in that way isn't it i think it should be repeated in every case this is a very common situation and that is asked similarly the spine as nelly has given some tips in this way it should be done and that to and the queries whatever is it been raised by the uh, students exactly so this is a very good one excellent case <clears throat> thank you sir thank you thank, thank you selvara now anand can you present one case just very short case just i i will discuss short, about the short case only the clinical part i would request selvara and nelly be there and uh, for the interaction and uh, any questions from there okay okay so this is a case this is a 9 years old boy presented in into gate for last 5 years slowly progressing <clears throat> this is the case so just i want to ask for the, the postgraduate students so what are the any other history will you want to um, interested to take from the patient the into gate for last 5 years which is slowly progressing <clears throat> in fact this was a question in dnb once upon a time yeah. into gate any any history will you want to uh, ask from the parents 
any history of trauma we can ask yes there is a history of yes trauma it's in the tra trivial trauma it's not a significant trauma there is a significant trivial trauma five years back as stated by the parents but it's not uh, treated significantly only the medication simple medications is sufficient to heal uh, so uh, relieve the symptoms that's all the deformity was not present since the, the, the day of the start the boy started walking there is no history of fever there is no history of pain in other joints and there is no history of any deformity in other parts of the body but the, the, there is a intocate which is gradually progressive in nature and uh, that is a concern of the parents that is why the patient is exacerbation is presented so this is the, the i think this is the summary of the history uh, dr silvaraj if may you uh, comment anything to, to take the any other history from from this case dr silvaraj doctor you are muted yes sir uh, yes sir sir i am unmuted you can ask about the uh, time at which the child started uh, walking the developmental milestones that will be an important thing to ask in the case of any uh, gait disorder yeah. uh, it is a uh, developmental milestone is absolutely normal sir <clears throat> so any other questions any other yes this is a also this is very important and relevant because is there is a gait disorder is associated see this is the intocate and intocate there is a cause from the hip from the feet it may be a result from from the deformity of the hip from the femur from the knee from the tibia ankle and the foot so if there is some developmental disorder or there are some uh, some neurological disorder that can lead to this type of gait abnormality so suppose uh, uh, we will come so it, it is a polio or the cerebral palsy so in that case the developmental especially the cerebral palsy the de developmental milestone is delayed so this is the concern about absolutely right sir so any any other history or we'll go next so this is the the, um, the case so can any any postgraduates please describe the the inspectory finding what is being shown in this case anybody please please try to tell inspectory finding which is seen sir uh, there appears to be some bowing of both the legs What the lawyers? Yes. Anything else? Uh, there appears uh, uh, some uh, tibia vera, I mean vera deformity at the leg, at the both the leg also. Okay. Tibia. So this is a bowing. That is an increase intra condylar distance of the knee joint, and, and and there is some deformity symmetrical on both the tibia, isn't it? Anything else? There is another obvious abnormality is seen. Can anybody pick it up? any serious inspectory finding is the path, uh, patella is normal patella is facing more externally rotated yes how do you know that how do the know the patella is externally rotated what is the normal position of the patella uh, uh, so the normal position uh, should uh, fall in a line from uh, Uh, anterior superior spine from patella to second toe that, that is different that is then from inspectory finding from inspection how to know the patella is not in normal position and is externally rotated you are as you are telling that is a that is a measurement okay so in that case you have to identify the sia so you have to find the center of the patella and the medial malleolus but inspectory finding how to know by inspection you can tell whether the patella is it is normal position or externally rotated or internally rotated what is the normal alignment of patella sir uh, second toe and patella will be in the same line along with the asis normally the, the the patella should look just away from the roof just away from the roof okay that's because of the natural external rotational tendency of the lower limb so the patella looks just away from the lower uh, roof if it is looking directly towards the roof that means it is internally rotated or it is far away from the roof that means it is externally rotated this is the assumption and that has to be confirmed by palpation and also other investigation other examination so as in as you can see in this case 
the upper uh, the surface of the petal is looking far away from the roof so it is definitely it is externally rotated okay now uh, so next what to what is the next uh, investigation or next examination will you do palpations yeah palpation okay so in palpatory finding that is some bowing in abnormal bowing of the femur that's all and also lower part of the tibia otherwise there is no tenderness no bony deformity no thickening protruding now hip examination this is the hip examination can you please uh, uh, pick it up what is the abnormality see on the left left uh, corner photograph internal rotation is uh, less on uh, right lower limbs internal rotation is less internal rotation of which joint uh, right hip joints hip joint is less so what is the what is that position called left uh, the just left uh, leftmost figure what is that position called isn't it looking like w is it looking like w or not uh yes it's deviated a bit deviated so if the patient is, so so we have to see the standing posture sitting posture and also the lying down so if it is the child sits in a w position what is this what is the spot diagnosis is the child sit in w position what is the spot diagnosis what does it indicate is it the can anybody normal can any normal child can sit in this manner sir is it a excessive femoral antiversion so what does ever so if there is increased femoral antiversion what happens which movement is abnormal at the hip joint if it is an increased antiversion which movement becomes abnormal in the hip joint so more of an internal rotation will be So what happens in this case just we have we have, uh, we have opposite we as you have told there is there is a increased internal rotation there is excessive internal rotation of the hip joint as you can see here so this left leftmost figure shows there is in abnormal increased internal rotation of the hip joint see on the on the second uh, second figure the external rotation is relatively less okay now what happens uh, the abduction adduction <clears throat> what happens in the abduction adduction can anybody please try to tell what, on attempt of doing the adduction what is the inference see the if the patella is now going directly towards the roof see see this figure if the patella is going directly towards the roof what is happening in the distal part of the tibia it is it is what happened internally rotated yes it is internally rotated It is internal is internal. So, what is the inference? Abduction adduction is almost. It is a. Uh, it is looking. It is acceptable. Ek to pare phone kare. Ek to pare. Ha, ball. Dekhi. Hmm. Dekhi pare. Okay. Okay. So what? So what is the inference? Can anybody please? What is the inference? there is internal tibial torsion as it as, is it is it appreciable or not there is internal tibial torsion so what is the next next step how will you confirm it anybody please any any post graduates it is from this uh, uh, from this examination we have the inference is there is increase internal rotation at the cost of ex restricted external rotation of the hip and there is some internal tibial torsion is suspected in the distal part of the tibia so what is the next step next clinical examination so it is a intergate so there is a so we have to find it out the cause from the hip knee ankle and the foot so hip there is a increased antiversion 
knee there is some abnormal uh, the there is some APF dysplasia in the uh, of the uh, physis around the knee joint there is some ankle there is some the abnormality of the distal part of the uh, distal tibial epiphysis and that will lead to some abnormal torsional abnormality and also in the foot the metatarsus adductus or there are some uh, abnormal on uh, neglected talibus equinovirus may present it with this this type of into gate now the differential diagnosis may be say it's a, a antiversion differential diagnosis of antiversion of the femoral head it may be idiopathic or it may be pathological as uh, dr selvaraj is rightly mentioned we have to see the milestone to rule out this uh, cerebral palsy as also there is a possibility of sp uh, polio or spina bifida but otherwise as it is progressive that is most probably due to that associated with some dysplasia group now we have to see the standing sitting posture if it is patient child sits in a w position it is almost as a confirmed spot diagnosis of increased antiversion and there is a kissing patella or descending patella if it is a kissing patella that means there are some some uh, uh, some increased uh, internal rotation of the both the lower limb that will lead to a kissing patella or the descending patella as you can see here this is the case of descending patella and if there is some uh, too many toe signs it is visible from the back if the patient is standing and you have to see from the back uh, through the heel through the uh, through the uh, from the back of the heel uh, so only the great toe and the th the little toe is visible may be visible but if it is too many toe sign is visible from the medial aspect that means there is some metatarsal adductus or the some adduction abnormality now uh, this is the test we have to do next next the special test can anybody any pgt plus can can you please describe the inference what is the inference of this test <clears throat> inference of the test what is that test please tell tell the name of the test anybody hello diptendu yes sir what is the test the greek test uh, the one you showed what is that test is it please please repeat the uh, greek test Why it is just is a flexion test? Why you are telling it is a correct test? It is a simple flexion test. Just patient is uh, uh, examined from the uh, foot end by flexing the hip and knee at least ninety degree. That's all. Knee should be flexed at at least ninety degree. And just keeping the knee, you can see the deformity is visible in the lower part. That means the tibia is also affected, and there are some internal rotational deformity you can see in the leg. so there are some this is, so how do this is that will allow, increasing the suspicion of internal tibial torsion okay so how do uh, uh, the uh, confirm it what is the next step next test to be done next test okay. Anyone? Anyone? we can do a crack test to uh, uh, exclude a uh, uh, hip antiversion or femoral antiversion that there is Yes, thigh foot angle. We can see here. This is a thigh foot angle. We have to see the thigh foot angle. So, how will you draw the thigh foot angle? Can you anybody please describe this thigh foot axis? How will you draw? Is it confirmatory to your diagram to your inference? Diptendu? Yes, sir. Is it is it the test is relevant? This test is the diagnosis. What? So that uh, tibial torsion uh, confirms the uh, internal tibial torsion. So internal tibial torsion. So how will you uh, substantiate? How much tibial torsion? How will you di diagnose? How will you how will you draw the line? We have to make a line along the axis of the thigh. So we have to make a midpoint of the thigh and and at least suppose this is the midpoint. From the midpoint, at least five centimeter above and five centimeter below. we have to make a line and we have to make a right angle to the to a point from the medial aspect the lateral aspect and also the medial aspect lateral aspect and the, from the midpoint we have to make a straight line like this okay so this is the thigh axis okay now how will you draw the axis of the foot suppose there is a metatarsal adductus then they, they, still then you can draw this so in that case we have to make the center of the heel this is most important center of the heel if there is no metatarsus adductus the center of the heel center, basically the center of the heel is is measured from a from a point just uh, from the posterior point from the medial aspect and the lateral aspect join it 
make a midline and at least two cent two to three centimeter above at the level of the of the uh, of the uh, uh, navicular tuberosity. You can make a, another line, another line from the medial aspect and the lateral may make a midline. And if you join this, this is the axis of the heel. But if there is a no deformity, the center of the heel can be joined with the second toe like this. Okay. So this is the uh, basically the thigh foot angle, which can substantiate how much internal tibial torsion. This is both the qualitative and the quantitative test to uh, substantiate the internal tibial torsion. And also the correct test is basically to confirm the anti uh, anti -partial. So this is the scenario. So is it is it confirmatory to your diagnosis? What is the diagnosis now? Can anybody please tell? It is a symmetrical deformity on the both the side affecting the distal part of the femur as also the proximal and distal part of the tibia. So it is basically it's a diagnosis of what? It is a metaphyseal dysplasia. You can see here. So basically the case is, is a miserable malalignment syndrome. Why it is called so? Because there is increased antiversion. There is external rotation of the distal femur, which is compensated by the internal tibial torsion. So if these three components is present, basically this condition is called miserable malalignment syndrome. So what is the concern? Concern is basically the, if there is a it persists for a long time, that will lead to so there are some abnormal pressure point in the in the retropatellar area that will lead to initially that will lead to the anterior knee pain. Ultimately, that will lead to degenerative condition. Now, what is the cause? There are several causes that we have to rule out the cerebral palsy, polio previously, and uh, maybe it may be idiopathic. And in the, in the, in the, in the, there are some another, uh, is it is a progressive one. So we have to rule out the dysplasia. So the management, I think I'll stop here because we have the constant time. So um, Professor M.M. Roy, please. Okay. Thank you, Ananda. It is a very good one. Now, can I share my uh, screen with that? Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, yeah, <laughs> this one. Mm. This is a very easy one. Lastly, I will take two minutes. This is a very common con condition. Ten-year-old girl. So please do a slide head. share. Sir, so please do a slide share start. Huh? You have to Let's make a slide share. Yeah, right side is sir. Oh, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, button. Yes. Yeah, go back, sir. Yeah. Yeah. The ten-year-old girl fell from height and injured left hip with this physical appearance. Can you guess the clinical condition? What is this clinical care? Because this often very often given uh, in OSCE, particularly in DNB exam. Very easy. Sir, sir, uh, posterior cancer. dislocation of hip. Ah, yeah, very good. So, uh, what investigations should be done? An x ray of the hip, uh, of the pelvis showing both the hips joint. Okay. Now, next two x rays are given to you, both AP view. Which one is uh, matching A and B with the previous clinical condition? No, 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 no. A is matching. A or B. Which radiograph is matching with the previous clinical condition and why? Some, somebody said it is A, no? Yeah, Pulak, go on, tell me, explain, uh, sir, why did you say A? Why A is matching? Sir, uh, yeah, sir, attitude of the limb is uh, flexion, uh, adduction, and internally uh, internal rotation. So in the first text, we can flexion, see the femur is adducted. In APDO, we cannot judge. Yes, adduction, sir. Uh, to some extent, in the clinical picture, sir. can guess. Yes, I was telling about the clinical pictures. Mm -hmm. And uh, here in the X-ray, there is uh, adduction is there. Sir. And in the uh, second picture, there is abduction. 
Yeah. That means one first thing is the head is not in the acetabulum, that is dislocation. Second thing is that the head, head is above the acetabulum or uh, not below the acetabulum. If you draw a line between the center of the acetabulum, it is above that. In Parkins line, it is upper outer quadrant. And third is that in B, you see, it is upper, I mean, lower and inner quadrant. And the, and the limb is abducted. So that is uh, matching with what? The B picture. Yes. Uh, anterior dislocations. Anterior dislocation, right you are. Next, what is this method? What is going on? What is this method? Uh, we, are trying to we are trying to reduce a posterior dislocation of hips. Hmm. How it is done? How we reduce it? So, uh... Under sedation or GA, we'll place the patient uh, on the floor, sir. Or on the bed, we can... Uh, then we'll flex the hip up to 90 degrees and flex the knee up to 90 degrees and stabilize the hip for a counter traction and mm -hmm. we'll pull the uh, femurs, uh, pull the uh, legs. Sir. Then what is the next yes. step? I mean, to reduce it. One is pulling. Traction, counter traction. Yes, and, and uh, adduction. What's the next maneuver? Adductions. Adduction. Anybody yes. else? Internal and rotation of the flexion uh, for up to 90 degree and with traction, counter traction, we do an internal rotation. So, the limb was in uh, adduction, no? Initially? Yes, sir. So we can do alternatively external rotation, internal rotation to... Uh... Little bit ab abduction will be required to reduce that. Okay. So after reduction, you find both the uh, I mean, patellar level is okay. And there is no flexion, extension, deformity, no or abduction, adduction, deformity. It is reduced. Okay. Now, what is the next uh, post-reduction protocol? So we'll, uh, Important post-reduction protocol. The, keep the limb under traction, sir, under skeletal traction for three weeks, up to three weeks. Mm -hmm. No, no, before that, sorry, sorry. Before that, you just concentrate on this X-ray. It is reduced. Have you seen it? What are the radiological features that support concentric, uh, concentric reduction has been achieved? It is achieved. I, I told you that it is concentric reduction is there, but based on what radiological features? Joint space is uh, equal on both the sides. Hmm? Joint? Joint space is uh, comparable on both the sides. No, no, but one by one, there are different radiological features are there here. One is that head is in the acetabulum, sure. But in AP view, what are the other features by which you can see that it is concentric reduction, is there? Answer should be, you know, this is this one. If follow my uh, the cursor, sorry. Yeah, this one. This is a parallelism. This has to pull up. This is not well seen here. Here you see 
this one, one the vestibular line and this is the femoral head outline this is parallel through all the from here to there it is parallel this parallelism will persist if you follow though it is not very clear but thing is here you see and the head outline it is parallel throughout this is one sign that there is concentric reduction of the femoral head and third and another point is there the size of the head here you see the size of the head here and here both will be the same if it is either it is posterior or anterior dislocation the size will differ in posterior dislocation the affected femoral head size will be smaller in anterior dislocation it will be larger so one is the head is in the vestibulum second the parallelism third is the head size what i was uh, discussing what should be the protocol post reduction protocol how to maintain in other words the reduction pulak or anybody else sir uh, we have yeah sir we can put the limb under traction in uh, externally rotated yeah. connected position right right this one this is actually for four to six weeks even less than that will do in a young child and that will help okay thank you so this is uh, seems to be very easy but at the time of examination very often there are so mistakes many mistakes are done so anyway uh, thank you all the faculties can you stop this one how can i go there siddharth yes sir uh, can you uh, bring back to my normal position Can you stop take it off? Stop sharing screen. Sir, go to six o'clock position. Screen share. Stop screen share. There's okay, an option. Okay, okay. okay. now I'm here. I, now I can see. So thank you, Professor Nelly. Uh, thank you, sir. Sal Silvaraj, Professor Anandabal, sir, for the nice uh, academic session for a, about a one and a half a half hour. Yes, sir. I think this interactive session. How do you like it, Nelly? It's very good, sir. I think we enjoyed it, and I also learned something today. I must okay. say, I also learned something today. There should be interaction because we are out from the students. Yeah. We are away from the students, mm. and even in the hospital, the uh, clinical cases are not coming daily. Yeah, yeah. And it is very difficult to exam also. That's so right. there's a gap. That gap is persisting. So to fill up this gap, but it is never parallel. I should say, but still it is better that we should have little opportunity to interact with them, isn't it? Yes, yes. That's it. Silvaraj. Yes, sir. It's a nice session, sir. As Nali told, uh, I too have learnt a few points because every time I hear Nali's lecture, mm -hmm. I always pick up uh, one or two extra points and. Uh, So Professor Paul showed a very uh, difficult and a very unique case. I think I must uh, take the feedback from him on what he is planning to do. Uh, and uh, this was a very common case. And uh, I would like to add one more thing, sir. As a post reduction protocol, I will always do a post reduction CT scan to look for any yeah, intraposterior yeah. uh, osteochondral fragments which may not be seen on the X-ray. Right, right, right. You are. Yes, sir. Post reduction CT. Just this sort of questions are coming nowadays. Both yes, DNB is must. DNB now out of four, out of three hundred, two hundred is OSCE, and only one hundred yes, is virtual. There is also virtual situation case discussion like that. So our students should be yes, oriented sir. with that, and the. And uh, as well as the examiners, they should be oriented with these sort sort of questions, isn't it? So, the new normal uh, 
situations, we'll have to change ourselves. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. And the PGTs, those who have joined, and those who are viewers as well from part. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for joining this meeting. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank Night. you, sir. Good, sir. Bye. Night. Thank you, sir. Thank